Today's podcast is brought to you by Blue Canary. The bird has landed on beautiful Bainbridge Island, conveniently located at 499 Madison Avenue. ASE Master Technician Clint Ramsey brings over 15 years of experience, award-winning diagnostic skill, and a desire to reinvent the automotive repair experience. Schedule an appointment online at bluecanary.biz or call them today at 206 206- Four five one four two two zero. I'm Maria Metzler, the Executive Director of Helpline House. The global pandemic has affected us all differently. If you or your neighbors need food assistance, mental health counseling, rental assistance, or parks and rec vouchers, please reach out. Helpline House can help in many ways. Find us on the web at helplinehouse.org. It's what we do. Neighbor helping neighbor. I got something for your mind, body, and soul. I got something for your mind, body, and soul. Here's your host with the most, Tiny Tim. What's good, Podcastville? You found the Bystander Podcast. Today, my guest is Susan Young and Carolyn Zimmers. Susan, how are you doing today? I'm just great. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate you coming on to the show. Carolyn, how are you doing? Doing really well. And what about you, Tim? Well, I'm glad that we had a little pre-discussion about goats and that you're a goat lover. (laughs) Yes. Hey, we're here to talk a little bit about the Virginia Mason and CHI Franciscan merger coming up. And for those of you that don't know what businesses those are, that's um, hospitals. And the landscape in Kitsap County is changing quite a bit. I am a person who goes to, Vir- not Virginia Mason, but uh, Swedish. Swedish has just decided to pull out of Kitsap County altogether. There's a big merger between these um, huge hospitals. I would love to um, get updated by you two a little bit about what's going on. Susan, could you start us off and um, tell you tell us a little overall picture of this merger? Sure. Um, The merger between CHI Franciscan and Virginia Mason is currently at a point where the two hospital systems have agreed that yes, they in fact do want to merge. And right now that's being reviewed by the state attorney general's office, the antitrust division. And the reason for that largely expresses what our concerns are about the whole idea of these two large systems merging together. That is that when this merger goes through, if it is approved by the Attorney General's office, that will mean that in Kitsap County, there will be no healthcare services that are offered by a hospital or by a large medical group that is not in some way, shape or form affiliated with CHI Franciscan, which is a Catholic health system. That also will mean that in greater Seattle, that the uh, number of hospital beds, which is how healthcare folks tend to talk about uh, market share and penetration of, of a healthcare system. Mm-hmm. How many beds uh, can they sell? Well, right, exactly. How many beds can they sell? And it it's up to more than eighty percent of all hospital beds in Greater Seattle will be under the control of 
CHI Franciscan or Providence, which also controls Swedish. I don't know if you were aware of that or not. No. The Swedish, yeah, they actually, when they merged, uh, Providence paid Swedish a pile of money so that they could continue to use the name Swedish so that people like you would not know that the merger had even taken place. Mm. And there's a third group called uh, Common, no, not Common Spirit, which is another group, but uh, Peace Health, which tends to be up more in the northern part of the state. And amongst those groups, they statewide control more than 50% of all hospital beds in the entire state of Washington if this merger is approved. And um, they seem to be bent on increasing that market share even more. So that's, that's why we're concerned. And, um, and, and the main thing is they are all bound to adhere to something called the Ethical and Religious Directives, which were written by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. And they're based on uh, religious doctrine, not on sound medical practice. Mm. And even healthcare services that are legal in this state are denied by these groups. They don't provide them to patients and they fire any employees that actually go ahead and provide the service if those services contradict the ethical and religious directives. So um, that's, that's such it. as what? Abortion? Well, if people always talk about abortion. They talk about abortion. They talk about end of life. And yes, those are covered. But there are a whole spectrum of services that people aren't even aware of. Things like birth control, hormone therapy, um, gender reassignment, following people's end of life directives, which people don't realize are also impacted by these ERDs. And the one reason people I'm don't sorry, realize- e What is the ERD? Ethical, ethical and religious directives. Thanks, I, I wanna make sure that we don't speak in acronyms for anybody that doesn't understand. Right. Yeah, I thought I had said that, but I but I'll say it again, and I'll be sure to be a little bit more. I'm sorry. Wordy. I'm not no, no, scolding no. you as my as your school teacher, and I might have missed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. 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 But uh, but the other thing that's a big piece of this is the ethical and religious directives prohibit providers from even telling people that services that are prohibited might be available somewhere else. If the patient doesn't know to say, what do you mean I can't get a birth control pill from you? Where can I get one? If they don't know to ask, where can I get one? Mm -hmm. The provider is not supposed to tell them. And when they do refer them, if, if the patient knows to ask, then wherever they send them is going to be out of network because nobody in the entire network is allowed to provide these services. So people think, oh, well, I don't go to the hospital. I'll just go to my doctor. But your doctor to have privileges has to be affiliated with the hospital and to affiliate with the hospital, they've got to agree to be bound by these directives. Carolyn, yeah. let me bring you in on this. Yes. Um, I, I think what she's speaking about here a little bit too is, um, do you have a medical advocate to swim you upstream through the the medicine system, right? That you get filed in these lines and there's assumptions made. It's kind of like not seeking out alternative medicine and alternative ideas through this. The advocacy for the patient seems to be missing in this process as well. Um, what are your thoughts on patient advocacy and how this merger will affect people that just don't have answers themselves and are seeking answers through medical professions, professionals, and they're steering them in one way or, or another? Um, I don't think it's an individual steering so much. We're talking about networks and hospital systems. And uh, we're talking about we're talking about procedures 
and treatments that are legal in the state of Washington. And Susan missed a few because there's so many. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sterilization, tubal ligations, and vasectomies. Most people think about abortions, but there's infertility treatments such as artificial insemination and in vitro fertilization, which um, affects couples, whether, you know, some transgender, but also, sure. you know, and then um, uh, hormone therapy for trans de- for transgender, transgender uh, individuals, ectopic pregnancies. I don't think Susan mentioned ectopic mention pregnancies, those, no. which is a big one because women will die if they're not treated uh, with an ectopic pregnancy or can, or you, can die. Can you define what that means? Yes. Ectopic pregnancies is a pregnancy that ex- exists outside of the uterus, but is viable because it has a blood supply and it will con- continue to dr- grow until that blood supply dries up. It has a heartbeat. Um, it, it's a fetus with a heartbeat, but it will never survive. It will never be viable because it's not in the uterus. And the problem with this is a, one of the problems I would point out with the secular health care that we're advocating, which would immediately treat a woman with this condition, um, the non-secular health care or the religious-based health care that we're talking about denies any treatment for this. They say this exactly in their ethical and religious directives. They will not intervene in this because there is a heartbeat. And that is that is the bottom line. If there's a heartbeat, whether it's a uh, whether it's an ectopic pregnancy or a miscarriage, there will be no intervention, even if the mother's life is at risk. Okay, let's jump into some religion-based speak about hospitals, Catholic versus Franciscans. Um, when I look at these hospitals disclosure or press release in no fashion, and they seem to be defensive on this matter, are the merger of the two going to be religious based Mm -hmm. and that they're scientific and health based collaborations. If, they're going to do that to monopolize the healthcare system to what they th- are telling to me, the public, I guess, is that we can serve more people this way. Where does the argument lie between they're going to adopt a certain religious behavior and interject that into healthcare? Well, if you look at if you look at their mission statement on the CHI Franciscan and, and Franciscan is Catholic, by the way, um, okay. if you if you uh, if you look at the mission statement on their website, they make it very clear that their first uh, goal is to serve Jesus and then they people talk- that are no. ill to serve Jesus first to serve Jesus. And then they talk about patients. If you read a copy of the ethical and religious directives, which we would be happy to provide you, you will see that in that document, it says it doesn't matter that Virginia Mason, for example, is not going to be called a Catholic hospital if it is in the kind of agreement arrangement with CHI Franciscan that they have developed for this merger They are subject to all the provisions of the ethical and religious directives, whether they call them Catholic or they don't. Okay. So Um, I'm sorry. I need to pause here to wrap my own mind around this. And um, this is the benefit of having a podcast. Sometimes I have stupid questions or I have a real desire to learn about something. Well, you have questions that your audience has right now. So yeah, I would hope that. Thank you. Some of these questions that I have are low bar, like my audience. Love you. <laughs> but no, no, I mean, the, everybody has these questions. Yeah. Um, with that said, I kind of forgot my question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about the difference between Catholic and, and secular hospitals. And non-transparency and what they're saying, what they're actually doing. Right. So does religion crash... With the medical book. 
like I can't do this medical procedure procedure because my religious based based hospital doesn't allow me to. The doctors will be reprimanded in these institutions and sometimes fired or sometimes fined, not just the doctors, the nurses, and other employees, if they do not follow these ethical and religious directives. Yep. So why is there not a government um, stance on this? Saying well, that's, that, what, that's complicated. Go ahead, well, Susan. Yeah. <laughs> let's get that's, into it, though. But, I mean, we have a new administration – and um, I believe Joe Biden is the second Catholic president. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So if Catholics are monopolizing the healthcare system to some extent, um, isn't he somewhat the leader that, that no, not at comes all. down and says, no, <laughs> You haven't even heard me yet. <laughs> I know, but it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> so, so doesn't he? Doesn't he have the ability to set the standard and say that okay, Medicare, Obamacare, whatever care you want to, you know, after the fact care, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, can't he separate church and state, church and healthcare? He can, and I think he wants to because he's always made it very clear that he does believe in separation of church and state. And he does, in his healthcare platform, he uh, does talk about the uh, issues with these mega healthcare systems. Because it's not just the, the, the Catholic uh, healthcare systems are an issue for us in Washington because of them circumventing the law by using the ethical and religious directives to avoid providing comprehensive services to patients. Okay, so Susan, there there's a section that says there's um, an exemption for the religious beliefs or whatever. Why is there an exemption? to start with when it comes to scientific based Medicare or medical treatment, I should say, why is it? Cause I, I, I see a lot of these situations where there's a belief and I'm not super versed in, in different religions and stuff where people avoid going to the hospital based on their religion and then wind up dying and accepting that as the religious fate. Why does it get a pass and there's not a certain standard of healthcare that's non-religious based throughout the United States and Washington specifically? Well, that's our argument that there should be that uh, not. I mean, if somebody doesn't want to go to the hospital, fine, don't make them go to the hospital. But if somebody wants access to health care that's legal in the state, they should have it. And one of the ways we're trying to counter what's been happening with uh, CHI Franciscan and Providence and Peace Health is to beef up the existing legislation in Washington to say, look, if a person needs something that's legal in this state, regardless of the religious beliefs of the system operating the hospital or whatever, that person is entitled to those services and the healthcare provider is, should be allowed to offer those services if they're clinically indicated without losing their job for doing it. So do we know for a fact that based on this merger that certain services will no longer be allowed? We Absol absolutely. Yep. And it's happened. It, and it is happening. Um, can you give some examples of that? Yeah, you want to yep. go ahead, Susan? Try to get a tubal ligation that's Swedish. Yeah. Um, a what? Tubal ligation. That's when, you know, your vasectomies. Um, oh. We actually have a personal friend who's uh, in our coalition who uh, gave a story to um, uh, um, testified uh, that had a horrible experience. And um, 
so vasectomies, all these procedures, and there's a lawsuit against uh, Kitsap. Well, it's, uh, it's about uh, St. Michael's about transgender because not being able to get transgender uh, 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 treatment. Um, so yes, people are being denied. There's a lot of stories. We, we can supply you with stories and uh, people are being affected by this and not being able to get legal, legal procedures. So these things are legal and offered by other hospitals, but non secular, secular hospitals, not not any hospital, not hospitals that are religious based. Okay, well, so or Catholic based. Catholic based. Sorry. Um, let's shout out those non secular hospitals. The secular ones or the non secular? Non secular, um, the Catholic. Yeah. The secular. secular. Yeah. Okay. Well, up until recently, Virginia Mason. Right now, the only ones that are left in the greater Seattle area are the UW. And multi-care. That's it. Multi-care. What's that? It's a system. It's a healthcare system that is in Tacoma, based in Tacoma. And they've got, uh, they're actually picking up another hospital somewhere down around in the Olympia area. So it's Uh, definitely in the minority of hospitals. Well, it is now. It didn't used to be. The majority Uh, of hospitals are are religious-based. And Kitsap County is uh, has is one hundred percent religious based hospitals with St. Michael's. Yep. So is that something that we need to adjust or embrace or break up and and look at as a monopoly? I'm not and embracing it. <laughs> I'm not embracing it either. The the problem is the definition of monopoly is very narrow. Hmm. And so when we use the term monopoly, we tend to think of a broader uh, spectrum than what the law actually will call a monopoly. And we've had multiple conversations back and forth with folks in the attorney general's office finding to, to, to understand better the language that we need to use when we talk about it and that folks who want to talk with about trying to stop this, the language they've got to use because it's, it's not, it's not as obvious as it seems. What kind of legislative issues do we have coming up regarding this issue? Oh, Carolyn. Oh, why don't you oh yeah. I was going to look at all that and I, didn't, I'm not prepared for that. Um, we have, uh, well, one of them is uh, Protecting Pregnant Patient Act, which will um, require all hospitals to give uh, um, uh, treatment uh, legally available, legal tr- treatment that's legal in the state of Washington, uh, especially regarding miscarriages and ectopic ectopic pregnancies that we just talked about. And uh, that bill number is 5140. It's in the Senate. And there is another one that is um, talking about these uh, consolidations of hospitals, monopolies, future monopolies, a bill that is actually going to prevent the monopolistic behavior that is occurring here in the state of Washington. And it's really based upon um, a situation that went on in California for about 10 years with the Sutter healthcare system uh, that was gobbling up uh, uh, hospitals, became a monopoly uh, and uh, uh, eliminated a lot of care, raised prices hugely and totally controlled um, uh, the uh, medical treatment in a, in a certain area. And so this is the, um, I think it's called the uh, Hospital Consolidation Law, which is five three, um, SB 5335. There's quite a few bills that are currently going through because the, uh, uh, the, the attorney general's office, other people, narrow other uh, groups know that we are in a crisis here because the Washington state has the, if Virginia Mason, this merger goes through, uh, Washington state will have the largest numbers of religious controlled hospitals and hospital beds 
than any other state in the nation, even though we have wow. fewer Catholics in the state of Washington than some of the other states that are affected. And they've done that because our laws are not effective for these monopolistic health care system network um, things that are happening. So let, let me ask maybe a dumb question or a ge- generic question or a general question, however you want to look at it. Um, is faith-based medicine a bad thing? No, you know, no, 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 no it is, this is not it. I, uh, neither one of us is opposed to people living their religious beliefs. And, you know, if somebody wants to have their medical care couched in their religious beliefs, they are free to do that. Mm -hmm. What we object to is someone imposing their religious beliefs on us. And, and that's the difference. And yeah. at, at, at any of these hospitals that are operated by these groups, whether you like it or not, you will be forced, if you want medical treatment there, you will be forced to live within the confines of what the Catholic Church has identified as being appropriate health care. Or find another hospital. And For- good luck with that. For instance, in Kitsap County, you know, um, if I were to go in there and be dying and I wanted to have my directives followed and have uh, certain, you know, uh, increased pain medication, whatever, I would have to travel to another to another hospital outside of Kitsap County when I'm dying to get those things that I want to happen. They will not give you the drugs that you need to, uh, if they think there's the slightest possibility, it might quicken your path to, uh, uh, you know, um, to death. But that's what our death of dignity allows us to do in the state of Washington. That's just one example. And there's other examples of, you know, women being told, no, you can't have this treatment here, even though you're dying. So that's what we object to is being told that when you're in a hospital system, you know, when you're in a hospital that is not a secular hospital, you are denied standard of care and doctors are denied the ability to give you standard of care. And they actually have to, uh, they have to not follow their Hippocratic oath because the hospital they work for will not allow them to do that. The Hippocratic Oath is something that they swear to when they become physicians that they will do. I, I don't know exact words, but that they will First do, no, do harm. no harm. First do no harm. And and not treating somebody that has a life and death situation because it's prohibited by a religious belief is doing harm. So, you know, who's the parking attendant when it comes to this? You know, who who wow. enforces these ideas or... Uh, deviance of the rules or the Hippocratic Oath. I mean, who's saying that you need to provide health care for all? What, what's the current situation and where do we get past the denial? I need help. I Screw your religion. I need help. And it. I'm sorry it doesn't fall in your belief, but my belief is um, life or death, I need a vas- vasectomy. Well, we need now. to change the laws for one thing. That's 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 we need to change the laws. And you know, there's another law, HB one one four one, which is currently being heard and will probably have a good chance of passing. And that is um, that is uh, about death with dignity, in increasing access to death with dignity. But who's who's um, enforcing this? Um, it's the Catholic bishop in the diocese who actually has the oversight on whether a hospital within his realm, and I do say his because the gender, his realm um, cannot do such and such uh, procedure because he is indoor, he is enforcing the ethical and religious, religious directives. So it's not even the administration of the hospital. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, it's it's the bishops, but also it's the legislature. And, I, and I'm heartened because this year, you know, the legislative session's on right now, 
And there are a number of bills because we can't keep fighting this one merger at a time. It's that's not working. Mm -hmm. uh, what we need to do is we need to shore up legislation so that when these mergers are proposed, then the parties involved know right from the get go what they are and are not going to be allowed to get away with. And then, and then it needs to be enforced. But that means that that our uh, senators and representatives at the state level have got to buck up and start passing laws that protect their constituents. It means that the Department of Health in Washington needs to step up and be responsible for its role in monitoring hospitals and making sure that services are provided. It may mean that the Department of Labor and Industries needs to be making sure that healthcare workers are being protected. And it also is incumbent on all of us as Washingtonians to keep an eye on this and, and to know what our rights are for medical care and to insist that we get them. And to not take no for an answer. I can't can't tell you how many people have said to, to me and to Carolyn, oh, don't bother. You're not. No matter what you do, they're going to win. And with that attitude, of course, they are. Mm -hmm. You know, and you never know what small discussion today leads to change down the road. Yep. What are some of the um, groups or organizations that you guys are founding or working with to get information out just like you're doing here on, on the bystander podcast. Carolyn, you want to talk about that? Yeah, I'll start. And then I'm sure I'll forget. Uh, well, we founded <laughs> Susan and I founded um, uh, save secular healthcare, Washington back when I had a conversation with her after I heard about the merger, which um, the letter of uh, intent, uh, there's another name for it, um, surfaced in July. So we got together. We started doing a letter writing campaign. We did some podcasts. We did um, a, a binky forum on this, which gained us some other people. We now have uh, a, a group I'm sorry, what's a binky forum? Is that I'm, where a bunch so, of pacifiers are oh, it's passed around? Sorry. Bay Ridge Island, North Kitsap, Indivisible. Okay. We uh, we put on forums one, uh, every week. And this was one of them. It gained a lot of attention. From that, we got a couple other people involved with our Safe Secular Healthcare uh, with a lot of medical background in on, in how these things work. And then we started uh, working with NARAL and the ACLU. NARAL? And NARAL, on national, uh, I'm, I forget what. I'm getting that. you. I'm going after you. <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, national Association of, uh, uh, oh, it's like, I can't, uh, NARAL. Can, okay. Can, okay. Uh, I'll dummy, dumb it down for you. ACL? You? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, okay. I'm I'm having a mind blank here. American or Civil assault. Liberties Civil Liberties Union. Right. I'm going to look up Narol while you talk. Darn we it. are going to put go, links go in the show notes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So I am going to go look up Narol. Okay. You look up Narol and um, yeah, other groups. There's a group called. Um, North Seattle Troublemakers, they're associated with NARAL. Um, now, Seattle, we've um, recently started working with them. That's the National Organization of Women. Nice. And uh, we also work with several local indivisible groups. Um, Shout out to Holly Brewer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Narrow. I've got it. National Abortion and Reproductive Rights Action League. No wonder I didn't remember it. It's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> and did you mention now National Organization of Women? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The Seattle chapter of that. Mm -hmm. And we've been in contact with the AGO, the Attorney General Office. And uh, the talked to lawyers there. The Federal Trade Commission. 
Awesome. Yeah. Um, what do you see the worst case scenario coming out of this merger? Oh. If the merger goes through and laws aren't passed to protect us, if I ever get deathly ill, I'm going to have my friends put me on the ferry with a note pinned on my back that says, please deliver to Harbor View. Yeah. And personally, when I, if I'm down there and, you know, I am dying, my husband's going to have to stick me in the car and drive me two hours while I'm gasping and dying and suffering because, well, I guess if I'm, you know, because I won't be getting proper care here at Harrison or St. Saint, Saint Michael's Hospital, you know, for us personally. But, you know, worst case, uh, worst case scenario for people in the state of Washington is they're not going to get their health care needs met. Women are going to die. Couples are not going to be able to have pregnancies because they can't access uh, the things that they need. Transgender individuals are going to be uh, 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 um, uh, there's going to be barriers for their care. People are going to suffer in the state of Washington. They, they are not going to get the standard of care medicine available to us in this day and age that is legal in the state of Washington. And in addition to all that, CHI Franciscan has a corporate culture that does not support charity care, even though they are legally required to provide it. They were sued by the attorney general's office uh, in 2017 because they were not providing the charity care they were supposed to. Explain They're, to the listeners what charity care is. Uh, care to people who are unable to afford to pay for it. There's a certain amount of health care that they need to provide for free mm -hmm. as part of being able to operate a hospital within a system. And it's a, a, you would think that particularly being Catholic, of course, that would be the right thing to do, would be to offer this care. But what CHI Franciscan has done in the past is make it extraordinarily difficult for patients who cannot afford to pay all or part of their medical bills uh, for them to find out what those services are and what they're entitled to in terms of care. And um, when a person like that walks into ER, are they like shortlisted to the back of the line based I have on no their idea. economic status? I have no idea, but what I do know is they're not informed, and I, 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 I don't know about the other, but I know they're not informed about what their rights are in terms of being given care and then not hounded for it. And, 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 sent, to, and sent to um, collections before they should be, affecting their- or at all. At all, and um, and that actually was part of the lawsuit. They had to uh, correct uh, thousands of people's uh, credit scores because they had sent them to collections right away, sometimes even before they were billed. And one of the techniques that they might use, say you walk into an emergency room and you need emergency care, and I've heard this personally from a couple of people and also um, uh, I think the uh, uh, labor union was um, involved with this, walking in and being uh, coerced into giving a credit card or calling their relatives or in some other way uh, uh, Securing saying- payment. Yeah, yeah the, uh, guaranteeing payment before they would be actually treated in the emergency room. So that is one of the ways. And the I think the average is around 2% or two, a little bit over 2% of charity care that uh, many hospitals, no, 3%, I think. But anyway, uh, studies and graphs, and uh, uh, we have evidence to show that the uh, Catholic health care systems consistently are below all of their hospitals in the amount of charity care that they provide. But they are also amongst the most expensive. And it's all yes. three systems. It's CHI Franciscan, it's Providence, and it is Peace Health. They are, when you look at cost per patient throughout the state for a hospitalization, mm -hmm. Catholic hospitals tend to 
almost invariably be at the at the top or near the top of the list. And that's I'm what the happens. Fits. Yeah. I'm not and familiar with Peace Health. What they, is that um, umbrella? Okay, that's another large Catholic health group. They own St. Joseph's in Bellingham, uh, Island Hospital in, on San Juan Island, and other, other hospitals. Um, I think they own the hospital in Walla Walla, which is another place where there, there are they, people there have no option other than a Catholic hospital. Um, the Virginia Mason merger would have turned Yakima into a one hospital town Catholic as well, because that hospital was affiliated with Virginia Mason. And rather than allow that to happen, the board of the hospital in Yakima voted to leave their arrangement with Virginia Mason prior to Virginia Mason going ahead and agreeing to the merger because they had such a reaction from residents. Public pressure yeah. from, from the doctors, from a whole group of doctors in the area as well. Yeah. So if the um, so-called monopoly is, is do, you, do you feel like it's based I got a lot of thoughts running through my head right now, but the number one thing is the, the opportunity and lack of opportunity. One being the opportunity for the Catholic hospitals to accumulate more land wealth based on merging with previous hospitals and then using that as, you know, a growth builder to accumulate more hospitals. Well, what, what United, do you think their rebuttal is in saying this is why we should justify this and this is why we are going to provide better care for more people because we are absorbing these small failing hospitals perhaps and that we're having a broader impact and opening up more beds because it, it seems like it comes down to counting beds in hospitals in a lot of ways. And just like billable hours for an attorney, how many times can you turn those beds over in, in the billing process? And are these payers, do they have the ability to pay? And, and it doesn't seem like it's, it's charity based. Like you guys were talking about that, you know, certain people that don't have healthcare and the low numbers that they're, um, contributing to getting back in a healthy state. Um, what do you think their rebuttal is in saying that this is the wave of the future? This is a positive move for your community. This is why we should absorb your hospital in your community. They, they will say anything. Bottom line, the Catholic church Membership in the Catholic Church has been declining in the United States for a long time. They're looking for another revenue source. Healthcare is it. In Washington, we have one of the lowest percentages of our population are members of the Catholic Church throughout the entire country. And yet we have the highest percentage of hospitals currently under the control of the Catholic Church. They use it... Um, as an opportunity to generate income. They take money that is earned uh, through their hospital systems in Washington, and they distribute it to systems in states like Texas and Kentucky, where they have, um, where, where the governments in those states have refused to expand the Medicaid program. They are using the healthcare systems as a vehicle to proselytize and to try to increase membership in the church. It's, um, I, it, it's um, disheartening, but it's bottom line, where can they make money? Is um, the Church of Scientology in the medical field? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I don't know. I don't know. No. Never have heard that. Yeah. I was just yeah. thinking that... Um, no, I don't. You know, they have so. a large portion of land ownership throughout the United States as well, and they're religious yeah, I'm, based. I'm not aware of any connection. The uh, Seventh day Adventists 
do have a number of hospitals, Methodists. Um, there's all kinds of different religious organizations, but they tend not to do what the Catholic systems do. Um, Why do you think the Catholic system has gone this route? Do you think it's just another way to get more membership or manipulate people or have a bigger growth or is it just hunger? You know? I think well, they're modern missionaries. They are. And, and the ethical and religious directives are a way of enforcing their beliefs of how uh, um, how people should live their lives and being able to control that because when you walk into a hospital it's not like um, it's not like a f free enterprise system it's not right. like it's not like you going to the store and deciding which uh, brand of milk to buy mm -hmm. because you know, healthcare isn't like that. You you don't have those same options. You don't, and particularly with monopolies. But even so, you when you're in an emergency situation, you don't have the opportunity to go uh, research what this costs and what that costs compared yeah, to what you need that hospital right, right now. Because, because for one thing, those costs by law sometimes are hidden. They're not transparent. Mm -hmm. uh, insurance companies and healthcare systems bury their costs. They don't want you to know that. So there's no way that the free enterprise system can work when we're talking about healthcare in the United States. Well said. Well said. Hey, um, we need to wrap this up. Um, can you tell people what you guys got up and how they can join the conversation that you guys are having? You gals are having. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say guys. <laughs> That's okay. I'm working on it. It's my New Year's resolution. Good yeah. Day. Well, the easiest way to reach out to us is to email Save Secular Healthcare WA WA. Save Secular Healthcare WA at gmail.com. Okay. All run together. All one word, no punctuation, no spaces. And do you guys have any meetups or things coming up in the near future? We send out an email. Yeah, we, we have an, a newsletter, newsletter once a week. Yeah. Yeah, weekly newsletter. We're doing a lot of work right now related to the legislative session. We have calls to action in that. We have letter writing opportunities, but you'd have to contact us so we can put you on the uh, that's how you would get on our, our email list would be to contact us at save secular healthcare what at gmail.com Okay, put me down. I'm interested. Um, well, uh, why don't you send us your I've email got address. Oh, oh, you got Okay. I've yeah, got you guys it. got I'll me. I'll add you today, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and send me all the links that you would like to include in this um, show notes here, Susan. And Good. Show notes. Good. Excellent. Oh, yeah. I can do that. Yeah. And definitely. I hope people can follow this story and contribute their thoughts, beliefs, and um, pros and cons about it because I think it's – it's a viable discussion that needs to be discussed. And if we start rolling the rock down the hill a certain way, no matter what it is, you know, it gains momentum and it can come crashing down before you know it. So I encourage everybody to participate in the civil discussion, no matter what side of the subject matter you're on. And I just like to say one more thing. The CHI Virginia Mason merger is not a done deal. And even if it does go through, we're not done. There is all kinds of ways that we can impact this and make this situation better. So please contact us. Yeah. Awesome. Carolyn Zimmers, thank you so much. It was nice talking to you and meeting you today. And Susan Young. <laughs> no, I'm waiting for you to say, you're welcome, Tim. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, Tim, it was so nice meeting you. And uh, I'm, yeah, I'm glad Holly, now. <laughs> <laughs> glad Holly Brewer same... hooked us up. So, um, yeah. So, thank you so much for having us. This was a wonderful discussion. Sure. That that effect died on me. But, <laughs> hey, let's move on to Susan Young. Thank you very much for joining me today. <laughs> You are so welcome. Thank you so much for inviting us. It's been oh, no, that's great, not fair. Great way to spend an hour. Yeah. Hey, I, I love you both. And I, I appreciate you talking with me and bringing this conversation to the forefront of 
listeners of the Bystander Podcast. Wow. And let us know when you've got this published and out there, and we'll add it. We've got an online digital three-ring notebook of resources, and we'll add this to the binder. Yes, we will. Awesome. Well, thank you, ladies, for coming on. You've been listening to The Bystander. Everybody, be kind. And if you like this episode, you know, share it with a friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. I appreciate yeah. it. Talk soon, okay? Okay, take care. Don't forget me, and I'd love to talk to you again. Okay, we will remember. We would like to come back and give yeah. you an update after a while. The door's open. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Take care. Cheers.